I appreciate everybody giving up some time and finding something different to do with our with our days and the participation from the folks that are on this panel. So thank you. It's interesting. This week, an article came out from Builder Magazine, Cheryl Palmer, Builder of the Year, Taylor Morrison. So I thought it was appropriate to steal a little bit of some of her approach and comments just because she is an incredible person, Taylor Morrison, incredible company. But it kind of says, crisis alters how people process information. And in order to respond to that, you need to take a step back and appreciate the crisis and then look at your business before you can plan and communicate steps thereafter for tomorrow. So when I read that article and kind of played it, played it back over and over and looked at Hyphen, it doesn't take much for Hyphen to respond to this type of crisis because we already work day to day on how do we satisfy and work for the builder first and Hyphen second. So it was very easy to transition into this, this thought. So very quick for a lot of the software providers out in the market space today, they think this is brilliant, right? Accounting, construction, everything leads to each other. And it's really just functionality. How do I hit a shiny button for my builders to work? And I think they've really missed what you guys are asking for and what you require today in the complex world we, we work in. So I think what has happened is most companies, most software providers that follow this type of model and think this is brilliant thinking, they've really become a, to steal a term from Taylor Morrison and, and a few other builders out there is they've really become just an interchangeable general ledger. And I'll kind of explain a little bit on that. So Hyphen does an incredible job of meeting with their builders, hearing what their builders have to say. And I think having the luxury of having 20 plus of the top 25 builders as an audience, if you're willing to invest and listen to those guys and take that knowledge and take what they do to dominate so many markets and then let the product reflect that, not necessarily for money, but because it's what the builders demand. I think what you get is something more like this. This is brilliant, right? This is the advantage that builders are looking for. How do I, home builder, communicate with all my suppliers and all my financial institutions and anything that requires home building, right? So a uh, hyphen has come to market and you can be a supplier or trade and you can log in and say, my air conditioning unit has been installed, plug it in their GM software, which hyphen owns and works, goes through supply pro, contacts back to the builders and you can get away from approving things, updating things, and one of the things that came up last year with the big public builders was they wanted all the proprietary information off of their servers from trade suppliers. So what Hyphen did was invest in a product called Wallet. And now you can take all that information when you do your daily pay, midweek pay, month end pay, whatever it is, transfer that out to Wallet. The banks now manage all that for you. They're kind of combining EFT and positive pay and they become the house that pays all your trades when you say they get paid and takes all that liability off your server. So you start now having a real end-to-end -end supplier trade-based software that communicates with everybody in the field, which communicates within the back office. And what it really does is now allow the builders to just manage the data and run their business responsibly and not retroactively. So if anything, just hear from Hyphen today that Hyphen is an end-to-end -end company now, not end-to-end -end land to warranty type software, but end-to-end -end solution and your partner. So I very much appreciate all your guys' time. If there's just a couple of quick facts here, uh, rather than read them all, you know, over two and a half million dollars, two and a half million homes have been built in Hyphen uh, in the past 10 years. We're on pace to eclipse that in less than five years now, just showing the market share, the direction the company's going over, you know, 75,000 active users. So Again, we'll continue to invest in what you, our audience, tells us to do because we are 100% committed to the home building space. So my last point is hyphen should be the only option moving forward. Uh, Cornerstone, I really appreciate you letting us be on this call with you, and thank you to the panelists for participating. Perfect. Kathy Mortensen is here to be our moderator today. Kathy, you want to speak a little bit about Cornerstone and introduce some of our panel members? Sure. Well, uh, as Karen said, I'm Kathy Mortensen. I'm one of the senior partners for Cornerstone Solutions. We service the real estate industry from land development, home builders, property and asset managers. We do a little bit in manufacturing, but very little. Our core and our knowledge base is really anything with the real estate industry. And we have worked closely with Hyphen, as well as many other software providers, but Hyphen for many years, we love the direction they take. 
been exciting to watch them revitalize our industry over the last 10 or 15 years. And I think this will be a fun poll. We have three panelists, two home builders, and Blaine Parrish. I've known Blaine for decades. I'm going to go through and let each of you uh, introduce yourselves. And we'll start with you, Bill. Would you like to give a quick little intro? Sure. Uh, my name is Bill Rectanis. I'm Vice President of Home Building Operations for Thrive Home Builders. Thrive's a Denver-based home builder, privately held. We build about uh, 200 homes a year. And my primary responsibility in the company is to oversee the home building operations, which include construction, purchasing, customer service, quality assurance, and permitting functions of the company. Excellent. And Jared? Hey everyone, uh, my name is Jared Amber. I'm the Director of Business Systems for Highland Homes. Highland Homes is a uh, private Texas-based home builder. We've got an annual volume of a little bit over 3,000 units in the Dallas-Fort Worth, Houston, Austin, and uh, San Antonio markets. And so there at Highland, I oversee our enterprise application portfolio, uh, project implementations, and then our BA team. Thanks, Jared. Blaine, a little quick one. Hi, I'm Blaine Parrish, and I'm the president of Inform Excel. We are a data analytics organization and we focus uh, specifically on the home building landscape. So we do data analytics and dashboards and data, any sort of data related project uh, with builders. We work with a couple hundred builders throughout uh, the U.S. and Canada. Thanks, Blaine. I think for everyone on the phone, obviously we're all here to learn from each other about how we're handling this crazy world that we're in currently. And I really like the fact that we've got Bill's team who's from a smaller builder I'm not small, I would guess mid-size, and then Jared, larger builder, and in the middle, Blaine, whose company services every size builder from very small to very large. So we should be able to get a good viewpoint from different aspects, different sizes of companies and different ways they've handled these questions. So we have a set of questions lined out, and we'll give all the panelists an opportunity to respond. And after a few of the questions, Peyton will be sending out a little poll for you. So it will be a bit interactive. You'll be able to poll and answer some responses. And that'll be not only fun, but I think informative. This is a big learning curve for not only our industry, but the whole world. So let's just jump into it. So the first question for our panel is, what were the challenges you faced when social distancing began? I don't think anyone expected it to happen or to go that long. No one was really geared up. Bill, can I pick on you first? Sure. I think, you know, when this first began and social distancing became an ever-increasing requirement and guideline, I think our biggest challenge was the ever-changing information stream. You were receiving guidelines and information from the federal government, from the state of Colorado, from local municipalities like uh, the city and county of Denver, and they all, they were all giving us similar information, but on different time frames and, and different levels of uh, intensity. And so for us, it was it was really staying abreast of, of what we needed to do to, to keep our people safe and keep our company operating as things changed so rapidly. A good example of an initial challenge that we had is very early on, we had a couple of salespeople fall ill. And now we don't think it was COVID-19, and we still today don't think it was such, but we had to react as if it was, and to step back and have them self-isolate, and then start assessing who they've been in contact with, you know, how far do we need to go in the six degrees of separation to keep the remainder of the people in the project safe and healthy. And then we had to step back and look at our job sites and the daily activities that happen out there. It's you know, there's a, a lot of hard work that goes on out on a construction site. Many of the tasks that are done out there can't be done alone. And, you know, for a framing crew standing walls, uh, typically one person can't stand a wall by himself. It's, it takes two or three people and usually within closer distance than, than six feet. So how are we going to implement these guidelines? How are we going to keep people safe? What additions or um, extra requirements were we going to require? For instance, that example of the framers standing in the walls, you know, we were requiring everyone to keep safe distance, but when your job required you to be in close contact, masks were required. And this was long before masks were required uh, as a general uh, safety measure. You know, some other concerns were would our trades keep wanting to work during this crisis? How, how were they feeling about the safety of themselves and their people? And so communication with our vendor partners uh, became a real 
important aspect of weekly activity to ensure that we were exchanging information with them, letting them know what practices we were putting in place to keep them safe, getting feedback from them on, on their level of comfort and what they needed from us for us to do a better job to keep their people wanting to be out on the job site and working. We had tools and, and things that we could use to make sure our superintendents were doing the right things and, and cataloging that we were. And so we, we started treating the social distancing and the other requirements like OSHA requirements. And so signage was posted around the job. We used our our quality assurance software to create specific checklists for social distancing and mask wearing and, and sanitation uh, to make sure that we were following the regulations every day and that we had an avenue from a management team to go in and look and say, yeah, uh, you know, we're, we're actively managing the situation out in the field. And so those are some of the initial challenges and, and things that we had to work through right at the beginning uh, to make sure that everybody was safe on the job site. That's interesting. I like the idea of using the QA system. That's great. That's very good. Jared, how about you? Yeah, I'll just echo uh, a couple of the points there that Bill said. I think, you know, safety is number one. And, and one of the challenges for us, I, I think it may be a little easier in that we're all in the state of Texas. We don't build outside of Texas. We're not dealing with, with regulations that differ by state, but different regions had different directives. And really even the counties, everyone was kind of sitting there, there thinking, what do we do? What is appropriate? What's responsible? And so we just had to take the line of, hey, safety is number one. We want to ensure the safety of our employees, of our, our trades of our potential buyers that walk through our sales models. And so I think um, we had to come up with a consistent standard, even though the various regions and governments or local governments may not have really provided a consistent standard across the board. And so those looked like things like in our construction trailers, like maybe we're not going to double book trades. We're going to have, you know, one's in, one in the, the community at a time. We're going to do hand washing stations we're going to have sales models. We, we had to make the decision to close down some of the models where they're by appointment only. So that was kind of, a, it, it then imposed a number of different challenges that, that required us to just think differently about, uh, about our internal processes. And then I'd say at Highland, we had just some cultural challenges that, that came through this. You know, we're very relationship driven. I'd say our culture highly prizes face-to-face -face interaction. You know, we believe getting everyone in the room together is the best way to communicate with clarity and achieve consensus. And so uh, the recent restrictions have just challenged and inspired us to think differently about, about our interactions. We're in four major markets in Texas, and even though we've got video conference systems, people like to, they like to travel. They like to go down to those other cities and, and meet with people in person. So that, that sort of challenges us to stretch ourselves in that way. I think it affected us operationally and we've got extensive product media on our website, but sales teams generally want to get the potential buyers out to a sales model in person. They would probably even tell you that the sales model is the best sales agent in that community. So you know, given uh, the changes and the recent social distancing that just opened up a number of questions around how do we best manage traffic and interactions? How do we ensure the safety of everyone? We, we don't want to take this line where we're starting to offend people. It's just difficult to limit traffic in a sales model. And so then you end up with a situation where your salespeople are trying to enforce these social distancing policies. Of course, that limits their ability to sell homes. It's just been a fine line for us there. And then, of course, you know, we've had time to reflect on you know, back, back office processes that could have been better digitized and automated. And then I think we've had some technological challenges as well. Like I wouldn't say they were really around a lack of technology. They were just mostly around adoption and readiness. And I think a large part of that is just shaped by our beliefs and expectations around how teams work best. You know, does that look like a team operates a best in a traditional eight to five, you know, office environment where everyone's working together, or is that more like an autonomous results-based model? I would just say we were, you know, we're probably more the, the traditional environment. And so some teams just never really conceptualized a reality where their team members would be operating from remote for any significant length of time. Like I think we'd seen it as inclement weather, things like that, you know, but but not anything quite like this. And so I'm thinking it's of some teams there, like accounts payable and uh, in, in groups that are, are uh, interacting with with actual paper. And so I don't know that they were completely equipped for a rapid transition like what we've seen. So I think we've been challenged to think differently in the environment. I, I will say that I think uh, one of the encouraging characteristics uh, about Highland is that we have this sort of uh, like enduring optimism and flexibility in appro about approaching a crisis. And so I'd say, you know, people don't necessarily show up for work today asking for change, but I think everyone pretty much accepted 
that, hey, this is our new reality and it's up to us to get on board. Good point. Very good point. I like the idea of the rapid transition, which I would assume, Blaine, that your team services clients who do a lot remotely now. How was that for your people? For our team, it wasn't a huge transition. We work remotely. We're kind of a scattered group. And so for for my group, you know, everything we do is cloud-based. We have and always have had a lot of offsite meetings. We generally, when we're doing a project, a big data project with builders where management has to get involved, it was always quite nice to be able to work in a room with a group of managers. And that's uh, that's gone by the wayside. But I really feel like in terms of kind of this general transition, what we've seen seen a lot of is a lot more requests for data, right? A lot more requests for information. And you just kind of, we all think about our own individual lives and how we've responded to it just in our our personal lives. And my guess is the majority of the folks on the phone have spent a lot more time doing a little bit of research and digging into the news and finding other sources of information and maybe a little bit more information on that information. And it's it's really no different for the builders that we service as well, right? They're looking for more data, more information, more data and more information. And I feel like a lot of the information that used to be provided through meetings and sort of anecdotal uh, type information, right? From hallway conversations, a lot of that's gone away. So you've got this desire for more information and more data about what's happening in the organization, right? And you've got fewer interactions with your team. And so we're seeing a lot of requests come in for more data, and it just needs to be more visible and more quantifiable. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for some of the, the the customers that we deal with, their data wasn't prepped and it wasn't ready for this, you know, for this level of deep dive, right? For, for this level of visibility. And so there's quite a scramble that we're seeing for builders to get their information, whether it's, it's something as simple as sales starts and closings, or maybe some stuff that gets a little bit more complex like cash flows. There's There's been a bit of a scramble for our customers to get that data in line, but uh, we're, we're seeing it come together, some a little bit faster than others. But you know, I think information has been, getting information has been a, a big part of what we've seen our builders scrambling to, to get done. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So this is the first one where we're going to take a poll. It's your turn. So what was your biggest challenge? That sounds like a a uh, readback of what I just heard from the three gentlemen. All right. Well, this is fabulous. This gives us a real feeling for what everyone's encountering, and it looks like overwhelmingly it's keeping our home buyers engaged. I, I think in a few of the next slides we're going to touch on that. Labor concerns and shortages. I, I would have expected to see more in that area, but that's why we do polls, because what I think may not be what's reality. So the next question for the panel is, so how has technology assisted you? I know we heard Bill say he jumped in and started using his QA system. Jared, how about you? Anything particularly stands out that technology, I mean, other than remote access to for people to dial in? Right. Yeah, I'd say that that first and foremost, one of the big kind of questions is, you know, how do we continue selling homes and, and what's going to happen? What we're doing in this world is, you know, a salesperson is trying to make and maintain connections with buyers generally over like a Zoom meeting or some sort of collaboration software. Um, you know, they're walking people through, navigating the website, marking up plans interactively. They're going to be uh, showcasing various design elements um, over video. And, and I think there's a, just a huge question mark across the brand as far as like, hey, are we going to be able to do, to do this? Because I think what you had before is this philosophy that says, hey, it's really like two things. It's A, getting someone inside the sales model. Like that's key. It's like getting them there in this personal interaction. And all of a sudden that was sort of taken away abruptly. And so now, now we've just been challenged with, okay, well, I've got to sell, you know, if I'm a salesperson and I'm, and I'm compensated based on commission, like I've got to figure out a system that works here. And of course we're doing that collectively as a brand, uh, but someone's got to give this a shot and really make the best of it. Like if we want to keep continuing, obviously we don't get sales, like we're not going to be in business very long. And so it's been interesting to see how people for, have been forced to take advantage of technologies that were already really available to them in just a very rapid, quick transition there. So I think sales is kind of the, was the big question mark um, in, in construction. Uh, we're using, you know, build pro on iPads, the construction guys pretty much can operate independently, can, 
cruise around in your truck and make sure everything operates. There wasn't really much of a need for them to congregate any, you know, in any particular place. Like we store documents online for our subs to access. We pay the subs automatically through Build Pro. And so I think that kind of already reduced the foot traffic in the trailers. And so we don't have to trade to come and buy off the ask for plans or dropped off stacks of invoices or things like that. And so we, we're still issues we, we deal with on trades and need to pick up, you know, what, a physical check and and things and we try to get we've tried to do some things like converting people over to ACH and and, and uh, you know pay people on debit cards and things of that nature. I'd say like back office teams or, or mostly really just adopted platforms like Zoom or Microsoft Teams or something to bring people together in a way that allows the team members to have a more visual presence and preserve that um, that sense of cohesion in spite of the physical distance. And I'd say the last thing that it's really been front and center is reporting. Of course you know, the, the business needs to know, like, how are we doing? How do we need to adjust? Of course, the, the first things that come to mind are like sales and closings. And, and then you've got questions like, are we building up an inventory of cash lots and, and just looking to make changes quickly. So today we're basically taking it on like a week by week basis to just kind of see what's happening and, and, uh, and make adjustments uh, accordingly. Okay. All right. Bill, anything to add to that? I think Jared did a great job of, of describing the challenges. I think sales is one of the unique challenges because it is a very personal experience buying a home. It's an emotional experience and one that takes a, a connection that is usually developed between a, a salesperson and the, and, and the buyer and the buyer with the physical model and feeling the space. And so using mm-hmm. technology to, to get as close to that as we possibly can has been a really important uh, for maintaining sales during this time. For us, uh, in addition to the stuff that Jared talked about, you know, we as a small company had made some transitions in the last couple of years and and in the vein of operational improvement um, that have become very key aspects to being successful during this time that I don't, I don't think we anticipated when we went through them. And it's simple stuff like moving all of our shared documents up to a drive uh, through SharePoint, using Build Pro Supply Pro as our primary document storage location, like Jared said, to to communicate with our vendors. There's very little uh, in-person time that needs to be spent because everything is is stored digitally out uh, in Build Pro Supply Pro for us. I think the one thing, uh, and Jared kind of touched on this, was the reporting. And, and one of the things that we use in our business is a, is a very simple magnet calendar board in our training room. And in this board, these boards, we have start boards and closing boards and boards that track all the lots we own and lots that we're going to buy. And we have uh, reports that back all this up, but there's there's something really intuitive to having it physically there in front of you and having different color codes and icons that tell you what's going on with that particular house. And you can walk in that room at any given time and get a snapshot of how many spec homes do we have? How many closings are confirmed? How many models are under construction? Um, how many um, lots do we have that we're purchasing this week? You know, what's our next, or how are our starts lining up? Are there any permit challenges to those starts? And it's really visual and easy. And when we went remote, we lost that. And mm-hmm. so somebody had to go into the office and bring up teams and point their computer camera at the board to to have the meeting. And during this time, we, we digitized that board. We'd been talking about it for years and couldn't find the right platform to do it. We were look, thought it had to be a real uh, kind of high tech platform. And we managed to to put it together in a simple Outlook calendar that's shared amongst the company. It has the same color coding. It has icons we can use to present the same information. And, and this forced us to use technology we already had to get a job done that needed done. And I think it's gonna to prove to be more effective and useful over the long haul than the boards themselves that are, that are so critical to our business. And so, you know, in addition to the stuff that Jared talked about, that's a simple way in which something we already had available, but weren't using to its fullest extent, that's gonna have real impact uh, in, our, in our business while we're uh, working remotely. Yeah, that's really excellent. I think that, I, I agree with you. I think we're gonna see some long-term changes out there. I can't wait for two years after this to to read Malcolm Gladwell's book that tells us what we did. (laughs) Okay, another poll question. How has technology assisted you? I think uh, while you're waiting for the poll to finish, one of the things I heard is on sales. I know from an implementation and training standpoint, sales is often, there's a, a large sector of sales team that is resistant to technology. And I think that this is gonna, we're gonna see some adoption here. 
And that's what we expected to see, right? The technology helped us along the way. But I think that there's a lot of creativity that has gone into this to make this go forward. Uh, what changes were implemented that you think will persist? What do you think is going to stick? Or I just heard uh, Bill say that they, they put up this Outlook calendar. They think in the long run, now this will be very helpful for them. Any other things that, and I know it's only been a month or so, that you guys have done that you think is going to stick, that become part of our our day-to-day -day build? Bill, anything besides that Outlook calendar that you've seen? Uh, yeah, a few things. I, I think obviously those the, those calendars that we've been talking about are they're going to stick for a long time. And I think the use of we've uh, really been using the Teams platform for our video conferencing, and it's something that we've once again it, it's been available that we've never utilized. We have our operational meetings and people call in from the field to the conference phone, and this has forced us to to use that Teams platform, and it's it's so much more useful and effective to see people's faces during these meetings, to be able to chat on the side and have conversations. But I think the old uh, conference uh, dial-in phone is going to go by the wayside and every meeting we have, even when we're back to full workforce in the office, is going to have a Teams component with it for those people that are out home with a sick child or out in the field that day so they can still participate in those meetings at a high level like they have been uh, while we've been working remotely. I think that that'll stick. I think the video tours that we've been working on with our salespeople, those are going to stick. We have a lot of out-of-state buyers uh, that are coming to Colorado and working through realtors works well. But to be able to have that personal interaction with those out-of-state buyers and have them walk their home, and walk their models through video tours, I think you're something that we're going to see continue as we get more and more comfortable with that. One of the things that I think has been going through our mind is, you know, we've always been an office that likes to have people in the office. We haven't encouraged remote working. You know, obviously when it's needed, it's, it's, it's certainly permitted, but it's not something that we've encouraged. And, and with the effectiveness that we've been able to operate, I think some of us are starting to think of, you know, do we need this large office space that we have? Are there ways to to save an overhead and expense and utilize what we've learned in this in this time of social distancing to continue to be effective and allow people to work remotely and downsize our office and uh, and, and be able to, to save on some of those overhead costs. I think there's one that, that's probably a little contentious among different people in the company. I think some people would like to discard unattended model tours. One of the things that we've put in place during the social distancing time is, is making sure all of our models were equip, equipped with Wi-Fi programmable locks so that a buyer could go there on their own and, and key in with a, a code that's specific to them and go walk the model and lock up on their way out and, and be able to safely go view our models. And I think that there's an opportunity for technology like that to potentially extend our sales hours Especially during the week, uh, the home building industry typically isn't open in very convenient times for buyers. You know, we're open during business hours during when most people are at work. And so to be able to extend our hours without uh, imposing on the work-life balance of our salespeople might be something we want to continue. Uh, I think others really like that personal interaction and we'll be happy when, when those unattended model tours aren't happy so that they can be there face-to-face, -face, shaking hands and looking people in the eye. Um, so that one was yet to be seen. It'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see how that develops over time. I agree. Jared, thoughts? Well, what's funny is that for a second there, as Bill was talking, I thought he was describing Highland. You know, it's the similar situation with Microsoft Teams. You know, we've had it available for years. Most people don't really use it because you're just sitting there next to your teammates. And so if you need to, to talk, you buzz right around the corner. Or you just, you know, you have to drive by and, and there really wasn't a need to do so. You just hunker down in a, in a conference room and, and, and that's how you, you operate. And so we've seen groups that particularly architecture group has about 30 people in it and so they've they quickly adopted teams the directive was given that hey you know upload a, a professional professional headshot like to your profile You're like let's let's immediately take this make sure everyone has a webcam like get with it make sure everything's working and let's just take this 100 percent digital immediately and so that's what they've done and it's worked out really well and, and i would echo again what, what bill said that 
even though we've had the technology and it's been there, there hasn't really been a, a drive to use it. And I would say in, in, in a little bit of a defense here is that it's really up to the people, the lead of that particular department. And so if they just didn't really see a need for it, then, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily seek out operating from remote. And so it's been just kind of just interesting to watch how quickly we adopted those systems. I also think we've been strongly challenged to just reassess the role that technology plays as part of our sales process. You know, just a couple of months ago, I don't think anyone who would have ever really believed that you could successfully sell houses using something as simple as like FaceTime or Zoom or that the website would play such a critical role in really casting a vision for the buyer of what their future home could look like. I mean, we're walking buyers through aerial videos, developer media, community plat maps and things to kind of help provide them with a better sense of the community feel. And then we'll use FaceTime and Zoom to, to virtually walk a buyer through the neighborhood and tour spec homes. Like we're, we're selling homes, you know, you got out of state buyers and, and people that can't just hop on an airplane or don't feel comfortable hopping on an airplane to come over and, you know, spend a couple of weeks touring the area to find a place to move when they relocate. And so it's just been kind of an interesting, it's been interesting to watch that. You know, I think in the past, we would have just leaned towards saying, hey, you know, why don't you come meet me here at the model and I'll show you around? Or, you know, when are you planning to fly out here and take a look? Why don't you, you know, let's set up an appointment. So it's been a real seismic shift in thinking for us. I think, you know, those of us that grew up in a digital age would maybe be comfortable with these new processes, but that's really not a familiar world to everyone. And so it just certainly highlights the importance of leveraging digital tools to get key information in the hands of buyers. And it's, it's sort of um, highlighted a number of opportunities that we already had to sell more creatively. And then I think on the construction side, another change that we'll probably see continue is just an, a sense of increased corporate responsibility. Like we call it just being a good neighbor. And, and what that means in construction is, is keeping the job sites extra clean, not leaving trash anywhere, not allowing loud music or other obnoxious behaviors and making sure people are parking, like the trades are parking their vehicles, not in front of other people's houses or things. And I think we did that reasonably well to begin with it's always been one of our sticking points is, is that we you got to clean the trash up at the job site every day you can't have anything visible like the highland lots and, and builds always have to be clean and in order but i think we just want to make sure that we're being particularly mindful of the other homeowners in the community because they're they're at home right now they're not able to to go to work or they're working remotely and so we just want to make sure that they see us as as great neighbors and, and not just another builder. So I, I think we'll probably just use this as an opportunity to, to maybe keep that uh, long-term. Mm, very nice, very good. Lane, anything that you would like to add? I know your team is accustomed to working remotely. Are there any changes that you think you, you would want to keep or that, that you see builders should keep? Yeah. So one of the things that, that we saw pretty quickly when a lot of this hit was requests for reporting for reforecasting. Historically, a lot of the, the builders we work with, when they've got a business plan in place, whether it's for the year or for multiple years, it was a spreadsheet that sat on somebody's computer or somewhere on the server that one person had access to. And you ask for a revised forecast of numbers of sales or starts of closings, whatever it might be. And that one person would spend you know, uh, an exorbitant amount of time going through and then preparing reports for everybody. And then, of course, you know, in a situation like we're in now, people want to see a revised forecast again and again and again. Well, what if we do this? What if we do that? What if we do this? And so one of the requests we got early on was having more flexibility for multiple people within the organization to revise their numbers, right? Can a construction VP revise uh, construction starts three times in a 15 minute span and everybody gets to kind of see the overall impact? Can a head of sales uh, revise sales forecasts, right? Multiple times throughout a single meeting. And having that flexibility and that ease of reforecasting was something that we never had really incorporated into some of the builders that uh, the dashboards and, and the financial reports that we'd built with our builders. And so we have spent quite a bit of time trying to make that process a lot easier. And we stepped back and said, wow, it didn't need to be as difficult as it was all along, right? It, it can be a lot easier. <laughs> and so I, I feel like um, allowing different people in the organization to play with the numbers, to revise the numbers, and then to share it with the team immediately is something that we've seen that's been very positive kind of come out of this. And uh, we really feel like that's going to persist. Mm, we may come out of this a much more efficient industry than we have been. This may force us out of the 1940s. 
Oh, another poll, a quick one. This is number three of four. So what change did you make to adapt your new working environment? I have to look at this and say all of the, all of the above, right? <laughs> but you only get one. I think it's interesting while we wait for this to come back that we have over the last 18 months with many, if not all of the clients, talked about the need to move forward with the Apple world, right? The ability to buy things online and shop remotely and uh, now it's on us. Okay, biggest number, business workflow. And, and that makes sense, right? We all, just as, as Bill and Jared have said, most of these tools we've already owned, just weren't using them. Yet. So changing our workflow, that's a, a logical end to that. All right. Are you working with any associations to train labor or get people back to work again or get other resources? I know that uh, here in Southwest Florida, last night I got an email from our CDBIA and had very specific skill sets they were looking for. People starting large projects, so they, they're not stopping. How about you, Jared, anything? Not that I'm aware of. Um, you know, we've had, I, I think, it was pretty, I mean, surprisingly solid sales and closing numbers. And so we really haven't made any, we haven't made huge, huge cuts and, or anything. And I think to get labor, it's kind of an interesting situation, but I guess you could call it a silver lining, but because a number of builders have just completely stopped construction, our trade base is larger. And so we're just continuing, you know, we're continuing to build and we're not really having to retool everyone or, um, or try to find other other sources of labor. So to my knowledge, I really can't speak to that very extensively, uh, but that's kind of where we are at Highland. Okay, Bill? Yeah, uh, very similar here with Thrive. I mean, we've had really strong sales in the last part of uh, last year and the beginning of this year, so has, as has our market. And so most of the builders are continuing to build here. Obviously, all the work in progress is getting completed. So us and our vendors are are currently staying busy, and we've been we've been able to maintain full employment for our people. And, you know, in talking to our vendor partners, they're staying busy as well, at least for the time being. I, I, from speaking with them, they're expecting a slowdown. And as are we, our sales have slowed. Uh, we're not selling at the rate that we were. So obviously that means our start pace is going to slow as a small to mid-sized builder. I think the, the, one, the one area where we have shifted things around a little bit is internally. The one aspect of our business that really isn't doing what it normally would is our customer service and warranty team. You know, we're choosing not to send those people, our people into our buyers' homes at this point. And our buyers are, are very understanding and, and frankly don't want people coming into their homes and to maintain the social mm-hmm. distancing requirements, shut down all customer service activity with the exception of emergency work or, or high need work that has to get done. And so those those individuals in our company have become available. They've, there's a resource there that that's not being fully utilized. And so they have been positioned down on our construction sites and are assisting the superintendents and project managers with safety and COVID-19 standards. So they're out there helping, you know, walking the job site, making sure social distancing is being maintained. It's hard on a scattered job site where you're building uh, single family homes around a community. It's not all centered in one location. So you can't have your eyes on everything all at one time or when the food trucks come up. And so they've been really helpful and out there in making sure the, the hand washing stations are, are full and clean. They've also been helping on the back end, making sure that the the homes are getting completed and the punch lists are getting done appropriately so that we're turning over the, the highest quality product to our to our customers. They've also volunteered to help us with some document storage goals that we've got that they can do remotely on their computer and help us maintain our, our document storage uh, policies and procedures that we've got in place. And so we're able to take individuals that aren't doing as much internally as they used to and really utilizing them to get goals completed and as well as to support the field team out on our projects, making sure people are safe and well and, and getting the houses completed. Okay. Thanks, Bill. That was good. I'm going to try to move along here. Kind of a quick question. You've all touched on it a bit. How far in advance are you able to plan now? Have you had to, I'm sure you've had to revise your strategy or have you? Bill, you want to take the first pass? 
Sure. I think the biggest strategy that we've, we've revised is just, you know, how to keep the sales process going. And we've talked a lot about that already. As far as uh, planning, you know, we, we really focus on a 12 month rolling forecast. So that's been our, our main objective is to make sure that we're, we're keeping that up with the, with the changing environment and that we're managing our short term closings and, and work in process to make sure that the revenue from those comes in as planned so that we can plan appropriately for when we foresee tighter times ahead later this year because of the slowing sales pace. So that's that's been our planning focus uh, in the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Bill? I'm sorry, Jared? Uh, so right now, there's a, an intense focus on sales and closings like week to week where we're making adjustments, adjustments accordingly. A couple of events that have just really shaped things for us is that we've actually lived through two, two deep housing recessions. Highland got launched in 1985 and in 1987 to 92, they kind of right away just got punched with a, a market downturn. And so I think that sort of made us set this course of just being risk averse and always kind of watching to see what's happening and, and just making sure that that uh, we're able to ride out uh, these kinds of ups and downs. And, you know, of course, there's the other recession in 2008. And so one of the things we've learned through there is just to move really quickly. But this time around, there's just kind of a lot of changing information. It feels like if you if you pay attention to the news, you're getting something new, you know, every couple of minutes. And so we're preparing, but we I would say we haven't quite jumped on board in declaring this to be the next housing apocalypse. And so I think we know that we're gonna have to adjust forecasts, but we don't know the extent, the extent yet. Because right now, you know, we like sales are still strong closings are still, people are taking advantage of the great interest rates right now. And so we just haven't seen this materialize in quite the way we were expecting. So I think we're really holding off on making a final judgment right now. A couple of things that have been kind of interesting for us is that some builders are dumping their inventory right now in what seems like a fire sale. So that creates challenges. Is they set these unrealistic buyer expectations that a person can just walk in in, in demand. Like I heard a number the other day, which I, I thought for sure cannot be correct. People were asking like 30% off, you know, of a house because oh. one somewhere was like, yeah, I don't know if they were just in an unfortunate land position or something, or just it was like they were liquidating assets or something and, and now people have this this idea in their head that they can get a house at this incredible deal and we're really pushing back on that you know we're trying to we all know that you can't really stay in business by selling at a loss or you won't be in business very long and so we we don't want to do that and so we're just selling our differentiation as a brand and and really pushing back and negotiating with other incentives like maybe creative financing and we, we've changed some strategies in, in construction it's just I wouldn't even call it strategies. It's really more like operational processes. And probably like many other builders, we've paused on putting new specs in the ground. Like we're holding current inventory at stage seven just to allow people that later, if there is kind of a downturn, people can come in and, and still make some cosmetic changes to the house and kind of customize it a little bit uh, for themselves in case we need to get into a holding pattern. And then, you know, I think most shifts there, of course, we've kind of covered this, but just the significant shift with sales and, you know, that was different, you know, by necessity. So. Okay, good, thanks. I think this is our last poll coming up. All right, so business as usual. Some have paused on construction, interesting, and others are continuing the sales. And I, and I think we're all aware that's that's gonna be our key for when we come out of this, right, is I've heard a lot of builders saying that they expect to see a big jump in sales, but with this interest rate where it is, I can see where we've got a lot going on. So talking about closings, how is your company handling closings at this time? I, I myself was doing some banking and saw a loan being processed out in the parking lot. It's something you'd never expect to see. So uh, Bill, how about you guys? How are you handling closings? Yeah, well, like Jared, we're continuing to to close. We have not made any big adjustments to our our planned closings over the coming months. Uh, those seem to be to moving along just fine. We have, you know, obviously had to adjust our customer interface associated with those closings. Um, so we always, as most builders, do a, an orientation walk right before closing. We are continuing those. 
We've made all of our other buyer interface meetings virtual. So our pre-construction meetings and our pre-drywall meetings have all gone to a, a virtual uh, Zoom uh, type function, but orientations are still in person to walk the buyer through the house and teach them about their house and give them a, a good demonstration and, and, and feel for their new home. We are uh, providing masks and gloves for everyone in attendance. We're making sure we're in close communication before the walk and so that everybody, so we're minimizing the participants and making sure that everyone is on, uh, comfortable with the plan in place. And then uh, we've even gone to buying uh, individual wrapped uh, individual package single pens that we give a brand new uh, pen to the buyer to sign off on their orientation walk through paperwork with a fresh pen that they get to keep and then our, our title company has been doing no touch curbside closings since this began that have been going very successfully so in, in combination with those two things we've had no interruption in closings that's fabulous Jara so uh, what we've kind of done is we, we've really had more of about a 50-50 split there with buyer orientations and whether those are going to be in person. Of course, you know, you can't, you know, the request there is like you can't bring your entire family there, you know, maybe just the the actual buyers. And then I would say with like the the title company and doing all the, the actual closing work and paperwork behind the scenes, like we just had to make sure things were spread out. You don't have people in the, you know, you're more isolated with less people around. I can't speak extensively to that, but it's from what I've, what I have heard, uh, we're still closing as normal. People are still, you, you know, that's, it's a huge push. Like if you don't, for a home builder, if you don't get closings, of course you don't get any money. And so we've had to make sure that those are still on track. We already had uh, largely uh, digital processes in place for everything. And so of course now we're just making sure that we're gonna be asking, or we have asked more for wire transfers. We don't want people walking in checks for anything. But but as far as I know, we still kind of have that, we still have a 50-50 split there where, where some people just really like to, I would say a lot of people really wanna see what the house looks like with a, you know, and do the final walkthrough with the construction person or with the salesperson. And I think what we want to do is just, you're making an expensive purchase. And so you, you want to test those things for yourself and just make sure that, you know, that what your, your expectations were met. Very good. And we do have one question in the queue. And that is, how are you buying the masks and gloves? This builder is saying we've been denied to buy them from vendors who supply them. Highland or... Thrive, have you guys had a problem acquiring masks and gloves? You know, obviously that's 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 a real challenge on the marketplace. And you know, we're lucky that we had a, a fairly significant stockpile uh, before this started that we've been able to work through and gave us time. And then we've recently purchased a bunch of uh, cloth masks that we're going to have in our sales offices and that we have in our construction offices. You know, they're not uh, the ones needed by our medical professionals that are actually have a Thrive logo on the front of it that we can have available out there on the job site. And so it was, um, that's that's where we've been getting ours. Very good. All right. Um, we have jumped to the last slide. This has been really great at sharing your information. And we want to honor your time for sure. If you have other questions and you want to reach out either to Dan or myself or Stuart, our contact information is up on this last slide. And we would be happy to facilitate coordinating a group again as this thing unravels or, or ravels or however we're going to go. I think our industry is, is making great strides forward. Uh, we've always been a big backbone of the economy in this country, and I think this is going to be another tell for us. I'm proud to be associated with it. Okay. We'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you you to the panel. A big thank you for sharing all of your information with us. It was a very informative webinar. Please stay tuned for more information about the webinar recording and when that will be available. And we hope to see you again for future webinars.